Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Both. That is KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway. And we are coming to you after a K-State basketball win. They've been few and far between over the last nine games, but K-State got the job done against BYU on Saturday, taking down the Cougars 84 to 74. Pretty nice showing for K-State, who led wire to wire. And this was really the first time all season where they went out there and they they got their run that they wanted, and they didn't really give a whole lot back. There were a couple times where BYU I think cut it to four, but it never really got closer than that. And you know, early on, I just I, I kind of assumed that it didn't mean much, but K State kept answering and were able to hold BYU uh, at enough arm's length to win the game and and do it pretty comfortably over the end, even though. They tried to make it look pretty painful uh, in the final minute and a half or whatever when the pressure came their way. They took care of business, though, and uh, got a much-needed win, if anything, just for morale and for kind of pushing this team over the final four games of the regular season and then into the Big 12 tournament. I think that gives them a boost because uh, you don't want a zombie team showing up to Kansas City and putting on a bad showing there because even you know when K State's bad, I think a lot of fans can get up for the Big Twelve tournament just because it's such it's such a fun environment and it's a it's a great thing. So you want to be able to at least show up thinking your your dog has some fight in them. K State at least has that for the time being. So we'll just start it off by uh, going through this game and what what went about for K State. They get the ten point win, avenge the loss in Provo where they made things close late. Arthur Kaluma had a good game, and then four other guys were in double-figure scoring as well. Uh, Drew, what was the number one thing that stood out to you and why K-State got the job done today? I think it's kind of like we talked in instant reaction after the game. I just think that it, it's a really good matchup for K-State, especially in Bramlage, to face BYU, who isn't a supremely athletic team, doesn't force a lot of turnovers, pretty reliant on the jump shot. and it's kind of how I didn't think that K-State would win by double digits when they went to Provo, but it's a game where I kind of figured that uh, if there were two win in Provo when they played the first time, this is going to be how it would play out because I don't think that BYU has anybody that can guard Arthur Kaluma. I didn't think that BYU had anybody that could guard Cam Carter at the time. So it's just a good matchup for K-State. And it is frustrating in a sense to me because – of how they played in Provo because they could easily have won both of these games against BYU. So it, it, it was a solid win. And, you know, you really got to see K-State take advantage of the matchups because Arthur Kaluma kept getting switched uh, with the BYU bigs and was just taking advantage. And we saw that all game long. Yeah. the I've, I've seen some comments that like if K-State played like this all the time, then they would have a lot more wins. And and that is true. But really it comes down to me, like the number one area is K-State made seven of 15 from three. That's 46.7%. That's the second best they've shot all year. One of the few times they've shot over 40%. And if you make over 40% of your threes, you're probably going to win a lot of games. K-State's won games where they've shot better than their opponent 10 out of 13 times now. So uh, that's that's a trend. BYU's lost eight, all eight of the games they've shot worse than their opponent from three. So it's even more dramatic for the Cougars. Uh, but but really, you know, you can look at things we did on offense that probably helped make that happen. But we made some shots. I mean, Tyler Perry hit three early threes that kind of helped K-State build that lead. And then they maintained it. You had uh, Bloom hit a couple threes. You had Data Ames hit a three. So you had the right guy shoot threes. Now they the 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 thing you can look at maybe is K State reduced the amount they took from three. They only took 15 threes. It was 31% of their shots for the season. K State's pace has been like 40% or more of their shots from three. So maybe that was a trend um, that that was a good thing. Part of that was also K State got to the free throw line a lot. K State had a six, uh, 64% free throw rate and shot 31 free throws and made 23 of them. And uh, free throw rate has been maybe the second best indicator of winning and losing for K-State behind three-point shooting. So if K-State's going to make 46% from three and then get to the free throw line 31 times, uh, if they lose that game, there's there's major problems. And e- even if you look at this game, you know, K-State's gave up 1.08 points per possession, even though BYU only shot 
19% from three. So the defense wasn't great, even though BYU did hit a bunch of shots. Um, but they they were good from two, and they got to three the line a decent amount themselves. So, um, but really, you know, if K State's going to shoot well, they're probably going to be in most games and give themselves a chance to win. If K State gets to free the line a lot, they're going to give themselves a chance to win. They did both in this game, and I would say if they do both of those well, there's going to be not many teams in the country that's going to beat them. Uh, I'll also add this is one a game where I think that the final score kind of lies to you. Yep. It doesn't feel like it was a 10-point game. There were multiple times where K-State had a chance to put in the early dagger and go up 19 or 20 and didn't convert. So, I mean, it it feels like the game could have been a lot more out of hand. Plus, yes. Yeah. BYU played the whole game with – some people would call it physical defense. Some people would call it fouling <laughs> all the time. Yeah. And I think they got away with it a lot. And I think K-State could have shot 45 free throws if – a lot of those calls were made. So, and, and a lot of those calls led to turnovers. K State only had 13 turnovers, but BYU scored 22 points off 13 turnovers, which is pretty crazy. Like they were super efficient off K State's turnovers for some reason. Uh, but, but uh, a lot of those turnovers came when K- BYU was pushing K State physically, literally pushing them to the ground. And then somehow it's a turnover. Yeah, you. I mean, you you bring up the the fouls situation. Like, even at the end of the game, there where BYU is getting it close, like they were getting away with being overly physical. And it's weird in that situation that that refs would normally they would wouldn't let that play on because they're anticipating fouls. They know teams are going to play that way. Like, I I don't know that it, it was an oddity. There was also, I mean, they were they were you know, it's like they they had the little. Uh, restrictor line that they have in like tiny high school gyms. They were, they kept moving guys off the ball, like on the inbound. It's like, this is college basketball. Like as long as the guy's not going over the line, like he, let him, let him play. I wild the way the game was officiated today. And I just, let's go on that tangent real quick because <laughs> look, I, I know people probably know me as the referee hater. Uh, and, and that's, that is what? totally no, fine. No way. <laughs> but I, I want people to know that it comes from a place of other than just like all oh, these guys suck and all that. Like I, I, I feel like I've paid my dues in this. I, I umpired baseball from the time I was 14 years old until uh, I got a real full time job. So I, I did it from 14 to, to 22 years old. Like I've been there and done that, and I kind of understand how to do so. Now, obviously, these people that are at a, are at a much different level than me, but. I do understand how some of this is supposed to work. And I have my philosophies on how to officiate games. And my whole thing was always, hey, look, if you take control of the game early, then you're going to have it throughout. And I think that's where things kind of got away from this crew today. And why, you know, at one point there, the, there's the the skirmish mm-hmm. right in front of the BYU bench that it just, you know, it didn't turn into anything, but it's totally unavoidable. And it didn't have to get to that point. But they kept letting stuff go. Tyler Perry was getting his jersey t- tug left and right. Uh, Richie J- Richie Saunders was all over the place with the hands today, just unnecessary. And it it was truly the worst officiating I've seen this year. And it's crazy to say that because, like Drew said, K State cruised in this game. Like it was not as close as the ten point margin suggests at the end. And normally you like go through all of this and you know you you would think okay whatever the the way that this shakes out like you normally you complain about officials when you lose or whatever the fact that people are this up in arms about officiating in a game where it had no bearing on the outcome of the game is pretty telling and significant and i i would like to point out again uh that amy bonner has been one of the worst officials for many years now in the Big 12. And in addition to that, Kelly Self uh, was brought to my attention. I had forgotten this. He was one of the officials on the crew in Ames, Iowa, earlier this year for Mm K-State. So there is some history here. We have seen these struggles, and uh, it was really bad today. I I go back to my point of if you know the official's name, it means that they're probably not very good. (laughs) So when you you see the name... Or they have great hair. (laughs) Yes. When you see the name and you're like, oh, I know who that is, it's it's never a good sign. Uh, I mean, there there was a few times today, and I, I pointed this out to Fan, where a call was missed just because the refs couldn't get up the court fast yeah. enough. Like, that, that's where I draw the line. You got to at least be able to get in position. 
Yeah, and Drew, I've I've sat beside you for a bunch of games now, and, and I I think you can say I have not complained about officiating as much, probably no. ever as I did in this game. Like Mason and I are the ref haters on press row. Yeah, I'm, you are I'm usually high. I'm usually pretty calm. I tweeted about the refs and BYU being super physical. I just thought there were so many times that it was obvious that they were impeding K State going to the basket, or they were pushing Tyler Perry. Or they were, I mean, the guy, uh, David Gasson made a move at the basket, came down with the ball, and the guy landed on his back. And somehow David made the shot. And it was probably good because if he had been fouled, who knows if he makes the free throws. But, <laughs> or or if he was fouled, who knows if he makes the shot because he, that's he true. always I makes mean, it with contact that's when it's not called. But when they're, when they're I, in the call, he doesn't. But I just thought it. it was bizarre. And I've got to mention, like, this BYU fan in my in, in the tweets came, <laughs> came after me and said, this is what makes college basketball great is because they don't call fouls. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, this <laughs> this makes no sense. And, you know, I don't, I don't know how much impact they had on the game because, of course, like we've said, I mean, K-State won going away, probably should have won by 15 to 20. But it was a game where the officiating was so bizarre. And, and Tang, you, you could watch Tang. At some point, he just started smiling and kind of laughing because he had no – you know, he tried to get on him the good part of the first half and probably early in the second half. But then he, he pretty much just gave up getting on the officials because there was nothing he was going to say that was going to help. Yeah, and I, it's – that's another topic is, is this because of what he said a few weeks ago? Is uh, Do you think that's in the officials' heads? I mean, that's a, that's something people say on the message yeah. boards and on Twitter. I don't usually buy those kind of conspiracies, but part it's, of me is at this point, I'm, I'm wondering. It's just so strange how often this year it, it feels like K-State has been on the negative end of, uh, and I'm not going to say like questionable calls, but like if you look at the totality of how a game is officiated and then the interpretation of certain rules yeah. at times, it really makes you think because I I mean, we've had three or four moments this year where we've watched a K-State game where one thing has happened and we go, how does that make sense? And then two games later, K-State's opponent gets the benefit the opposite way of that call where I think, you know, early on the tech game, it was, oh, well, it's not a shooting foul because the guy going up for the alley-oop didn't possess the ball. and then. That happened again later. Was it the Oklahoma yeah, the, State was, game? It was or? the KU game. Okay, yeah, the, the KU game. Uh, the, the Iowa State game, they said, hey, we can't review the clock at the end of the first half. They review the clock at the end of the Oklahoma State game in the first half. like In the first, like, eight seconds. So many of these things that just don't compute with how things end up going. And then we saw it today. They, call, they, didn't, they don't call a foul for – uh, Tyler Perry was on the gr ground and he was trying to get the ball or he wasn't on the ground, but a BYU guy was there. Perry trips over him and he even, you know, gave a little bit of a, a wing yeah. there, the BYU guy. And we've seen numerous times this season, K-State has a guy on the ground. He cannot do anything. He, he just ended up there from the play and they get tagged for the foul. I do think that there's a little bit of this. And I, I think that you, these officials, obviously, they know each other. They work together, and I, I think that for whatever reason, I do think there's a little bit of it, whether it's intentional or subconscious. They they are they aren't helping Jerome Tang out at all, and it's not their job to do that. But relative to everybody else, Jerome Tang is is not getting any benefit of doubt that he deserves. Tyler Perry never gets a call. I mean, yeah. the, the the first time he gets a call will be like the first time all season. Like, yeah. And, and, you know, we, we can, I mean, we can be honest that sometimes he, he makes the motions to try to get a call and doesn't get them. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's times where maybe he falls down where he shouldn't have gotten a call. I, I, I get that. Like, I think we've seen that throughout the season, but today's game specifically, I think there were times where he was legitimately just pushed to the ground. And I don't know if it's because he's small or, or what, but he does not, he was not getting calls today and he's not gotten some multiple times this year just because. I think of that size factor, like they're like, well, he's a small guy. He's going to flop. And, and, you know, they've pretty much gone away with, uh, they don't call flops anymore. Like that's not a thing, but they don't call anything is what kind of their, their answer is anymore is, is we're just not going to call anything. And this guy's going to lay on the ground for two seconds and get up. So yeah, it's kind of, it's weird. Which, which by the way, the flop call, 
it, that it, that in itself was created because these officials are not good enough to do their jobs. Yeah. Because the reason why people hate flopping is because these refs were calling fouls on flops. Flopping isn't a big deal if you just don't make a call and you let a guy go to the basket or you yeah. know whatever else. Like that's to, that to me is how you fix flopping is you start just quit stop and play. Quit giving guys that are 65% free throw shooters two shots and, you know, let them let go and finish or whatever else. I think that's part of it, too. Like, these refs were not good enough to distinguish what is a real foul and what isn't. And so we had to add this flopping thing, and it didn't work. And so now they're just like, well, I, I can't really tell, so I'm not going to call anything. I think, it's, I think it's a problem. I think it's been an issue. And uh, I just want to point out that officiating was not this bad last year when John Higgins was still on the court and had a whistle in his mouth. So <laughs> shout out to my guy, John Higgins. He was the glue. He was the glue guy of officiating. Uh, throughout the Big 12, and it's all gone. So uh, it's it's tough trying to to get past that. Uh, all right, final thing I'll dead. say on this, yeah, RIP John Higgins, not dead. Just yep, not happened dead. to watch tons of Pac-12 <laughs> and WCC games. Uh, it's funny that we like it that it feels like K State kind of got screwed on the whistle, and they shot 15 more free throws than yeah. BYU today. Uh, the free throw situation was something we talked about going into the first game against BYU and being mm -hmm. important. K-State didn't take advantage of it. They did today. That feels like a, a pretty significant reason why they were able to uh, win the game. Yeah, and I mean, that kind of goes back to how the, how the game is officiated is that it seemed like K-State and specifically Arthur Kaluma just knew that if he drove in, there was going to be contact and it was probably going to get called. And he did a really good job of taking advantage of the switches and just kept getting to the basket. I mean, that that that's the Arthur Kaluma that like we were hoping to see all season was was tonight or today's. Yeah, I mean, I think the free throw number is is good indicator of how K-State played. I think that free throw number goes along with the three point number, like a lower amount of three point shots and then a higher amount of free throws is a good indicator that K-State's attacking the basket. And that's when they're at their best. Um, we talked during the game about Cam struggling, but he did, you know, do a good job. He got to the free throw line four times on a couple of, of drives, which is good. Uh, Tyler Perry got to the free throw line five times. David Gasson got four times. Will McNair got four times. So you have multiple guys getting the free throw line, but really it's Kaluma's 12, 12 free throw attempts really dictated. And, and it was a lot. I mean, it was all him going downhill. I mean, he got fouled on one three for three of those, but most of those came from him attacking the rim and getting downhill. And that's, that's an indicator of K-State playing the, the way they want to play. Um, and against a BYU team that is not the most laterally quick team in the country, um, that's a good way to play. Like, they did a great job, you know, attacking. And, and you know, to give the officials credit, when when K-State did get to the paint and drive, they did get some of those calls. And Kaluma got several that were, you know, maybe not quite questionable, but iffy. Sometimes they don't get called. But because he was on the attack, he got – foul calls on those so give him credit um kaluma i mean we'll talk about him but probably his best game as a cat for sure and maybe the best in his career uh you don't think ali khalifa is laterally quick <laughs> i know drew doesn't he was talking about it the entire game that he thought he could beat him in a race i could definitely beat ali khalifa in a race i'm still throwing that out there uh we will talk about arthur kaluma because <laughs> He had an awesome game against BYU last year when he was at Creighton. Uh, he had 27 points in that game. He has 28 against them today. And we have seen flashes at points this year of Kaluma being the attacker and and taking it and getting it into the paint. I think, I mean, he did it pretty well against Villanova, I'm pretty sure, also a team that he had success against while he was at Creighton. I mean, why is it that it seems like Arthur Kaluma is inconsistent in this because I, I'm not even necessarily asking him to finish constantly in games, but it just feels like that's something that he doesn't even attempt half the time. Is it matchup based or is it confidence based for him to where he sees two teams that he's, he's had great success against in his career. I, I think that it's matchup based a little bit like, because Villanova also isn't like a supremely laterally quick team. So I think that it's him just taking advantage of being a better athlete than the guys on BYU and Villanova. Because, I mean, to be honest, Arthur Kluma isn't, like, the world's best athlete. Like, 
Keontae Johnson was more athletic than he was. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that we all agree with that. So I think it's just him taking advantage of teams that aren't as quick as he is and just take in getting to the basket. Yeah, I would agree. I think when he knows, I think it's a confidence thing for him. When he knows he can get his first step and get, especially going to the right, because he off, I mean, he's mostly going to go to the right against people. Um, when he can get that first step and get even with somebody and get downhill, I think he's a conf, much more confident player. Uh, we've seen where people take that away. Often he's more turnover prone. He's going to get those four or five turnovers in a game in that situation. But today I think he knew uh, against about anyone he was going to be matched up against, he could get downhill and get that first step going to his right. And and once he gets in that position, he's really tough to stop because uh, he's – He's so long. He's got those long strides, and then he does that euro step thing once he gets to the lane, which is really hard to guard. Even though he's always going to go back to his right hand, like he mm-hmm. he does not. He, he's allergic to his left hand. I mean, everybody <laughs> has to know that. But he's so good at even on the left side of the basket finishing with his right hand. So when he gets in that situation, he's going to take advantage, and he definitely did today. Yeah, I mean, he was he's really good. Twenty eight points there. He also led the team in rebounds. Uh, 10 boards for him on the day. He was efficient everywhere that he took shots at. And, I mean, Tyler Perry was also key in all this, the way that he came in and he knocked down shots early. And I, I talked about this with Drew after the game where Tyler Perry was was good against KU. He did some things there. But there was even the opportunity in that game for him to add early for K-State to where maybe the lead could have been better and maybe it's not you know, like it is at the end because he missed some open shots that he got. He hit the shots early when he got the opportunity. And then the one three that he ends up making in the second half was when BYU went to their zone and Mm -hmm. they got him open in the corner and he got enough of the right look and he knocked it down. And that's what you need out of Tyler Perry. It hasn't been that K-State needs, I mean, some games they have needed it, but I, I don't think the expectation should be Tyler Perry's got to go out and be Marquise Noel and have 24 points tonight. It's when he gets the open look, make three or four threes a game for you because that really helps this K-State offense. I mean, we talked about it today up there, but this team is hurt by the fact that they can only put three guys on the floor at max that can make a three that you're really scared about as an opponent. And how many times does David Gasson catch the ball in a spot that you go, man, if this guy could just shoot, if David Gasson could shoot 28% from three, and at least be somewhat of a threat to take that shot occasionally or knock it down when he's open, that would make K-State's offense even like worlds better than what it is right now in my my eyes. So I think that was big for Tyler Perry. You get that out of him. He steps up, makes the shots when he has the opportunity, and uh, that that was a big thing for him today, and we'll see how it kind of carries over the rest of the season. Because honestly, probably since the Oklahoma game, Tyler Perry has been – a lot more consistent and reliable Mm -hmm. for K-State and has kind of been the guy that you thought they might get when he arrived from North Texas. Yeah, it it was huge, not just for Perry, but for K-State for him to hit those first three threes because I I don't know if you hit the driving lanes and can get to the basket as easy if he even goes one of three in that spot. And with how K-State has shot, you, you never know because if he starts one of three, does he take another one? In the first half, does he make another one? So it was big for him to get uh, his confidence up, and it really boosted K-State early on. Can, can we pull up the, the stat graphic again for uh, for everybody that missed it? Yeah. Uh, Spencer Johnson had a kid yesterday. Is one of the funniest <laughs> stat lines I, I think that I've seen in a while. Uh, well, it's true. He did have a kid yesterday, uh, and I mean – well, let's we're going to get ready to talk about K-State big picture stuff here for a second. But uh, I, I, I I want to spotlight both of those BYU players for different reasons. Yes, <laughs> Spencer Johnson had a kid yesterday. Uh, he was with the Cougars today and play, knocked down a couple shots, had 12 points, all of that. Uh, came into the, the postgame press conference barefoot, which <laughs> is a move considering that back room in Bramlage. I'm, I'm not sure I would trust my bare feet. I, I don't really want to walk in there in short sleeves. Uh, you don't know what, what's lurking back there. Uh, but then in addition to that, Kellis asked Mark Pope about 
He's like, how are you guys going to spend your time from today until Tuesday? Because for those that don't know, BYU plays at KU on Tuesday. So you're like, oh, the Big 12 did them a solid and gave them not only they gave them the extra day of rest. They didn't make them do the Saturday, Monday turnaround, but they're doing Saturday, Tuesday. They can stay close like they don't have to. No, BYU is flying back to Provo yes, yesterday. Well, they already did on Saturday. They flew, flew back. They were going to fly back to Kansas then on Monday for their game on Tuesday in Allen Fieldhouse, uh, just so, as Mark Pope said, they can all go see Joey Johnson. So uh, congratulations to Spencer Johnson uh, from one father to another. Congratulations on that. Um, that guy that's older than us. Yeah, older than me. Uh, <laughs> shout out to shout out to his wife for letting him go play a basketball game, uh, despite just having a kid yesterday. Because uh, I don't think I was allowed out of the house for like two months after my kid was born. Um, that's not true. I I'm obviously my kid was born in August, and I was at the home opener for football. So uh, I did do some things, but not that quick. Uh, and I'm just glad, you know, not a shot to Spencer Johnson. I'm sure he's going to be a great dad. Um, but I'm just gr- glad that his kid only knows him as a loser as of now. So, uh, fortunate for that. And then the other guy that was on that graphic who, you know, knocked down a couple shots, no Waterman, he had 12 points as well. He hits a three with BYU down 16 to go down 13 with like six minutes left and turns around and blows a kiss to the K State student section like he's taunting them. It's like, eh, you know what, dude? Like, <laughs> Yeah, you, you're you're a punchable college basketball player. That I, that makes sense. But normally you would do this when you're winning or like you know you've made it tight or something. You're down 13 still. I would maybe worry about some other things than blowing kisses to the crowd. So I just wanted to highlight those two guys. Uh, all time performances today for the Cougars. There's a lot of sicko behavior from BYU players. You had two guys in full uniform two hours before the game. Richie Saunders was one of them with, with his headband on two hours before the game. You had Spencer Johnson in, in his socks during post game. You had Noah Waterman taunting the crowd to hit a shot to cut it to 13. Like it, it was a bizarre game for BYU for seeing them for the first time in person. Yeah. And it, there was lots of interesting things like they, they're two bigs that like really gave us trouble in the first game. Ali Khalifa plays 17 minutes and Traore plays 12 minutes in the game. Like it seemed like when Traore was in the game, they were running a pick and roll and he was wide open under the rim every time. But uh, it was a strange. And then the last 10 minutes they put in a Tiki who's played like two minutes or three minutes a game the last two months of the season. So it was odd the way, you know, things kind of went down for them. But, you know, good for K-State to get a win and a, a quad one win, our third quad one win, and third time beating a top 20 net team this season. So pretty solid to, to get that done. By the way, Mark yeah. Pope is also a giant. Yeah, tall man. We, we, we learned that in post game too. I knew he was tall, but <laughs> I didn't realize, like, he was that tall. And, and Drew looked it up. He was listed at 6'10 yeah. when he was in the NBA. So – uh, he's he's a big dude. So uh, K State resume wise, you you mentioned it there. Uh, good wins. It I I didn't update that yet. That's they are three and five uh, now with their their wins and everything else. Uh, the way that it ends up setting up, that just hasn't updated on the net site because we're recording this on Saturday. But three wins against quad one teams, four and five against quad two, and. Uh, unfortunately for, for K state Villanova didn't want to help them out and beat UConn on the road today. So Villanova yeah. will not be going up to, to quad one, which they probably would have with a win. Uh, but nonetheless, that's still, that's going to stay probably as a quad two win. Providence continues to pace to be an NCAA tournament team. Uh, watch out UCF just trying to make themselves look like a nice little win for K state. Uh, and then, you know, the, the Wildcats, the overall record, is, is it's not great, but also they can get it to a point where it looks respectable and it trends in the right direction. And you see the remaining four regular season games there, a, a game that K State should win on Monday against West Virginia, and then two tough road matchups with Cincinnati and KU, and then the home game against Iowa State to close things out. So K State is has given themselves a chance. They have put some juice into this season now. What should the expectation be moving forward? Because 
as as much as there's positivity now and you can make the case and you can kind of you can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel at the end of the day this was just one game for K-State and if you still look at the last 9 games they're 2 and 7 and you can take a lot of things from this game that were good but you can also look at a lot of things and say those are one offs you were due wasn't BYU's night and that's why you won the game yeah, K State's now in position to be in position. You're you're hopeful after winning a game like this, where you pretty much dominated a team that's a metric darling. So you yeah. you'll get a, an added boot uh, an added boost with that. You have an extremely winnable game Monday night. Cincinnati's kind of in free fall territory, where you yeah. hope that you can steal that one. And then you win one of K or Iowa State, and you're going to be right on the on the cusp. And it's probably going to take one game in Kansas City, because I, I just I don't I don't know if nine and nine will get it done with who four of the wins are against. But at the same time, like we have we have uh, life now. Like I didn't think that we'd be sitting here talking about K State potentially making the NCAA tournament even a couple days ago. So it, it puts you in position to really do something. Yeah, it, it is helpful. I mean, you got to get some good wins. Uh, K-State's road record with only two road wins is going to be hurtful to them. Um, it is interesting compared to like Cincinnati. Like Cincinnati going into today was 30 spots better than the net. That, but you look at the two resumes and K-State argu- arguably has the better resume than Cincinnati um, right now. And I think they do. Um, based on both teams having three quad one wins, but K-State has four quad two wins compared to only two from Cincinnati. Cincinnati also has two quad three losses at this point. So some things to look at. I don't think Cincinnati is well, a tournament team right now either, but it's just interesting to see that difference in the in the net ranking. And I want to I want to throw this out there too, because I, so uh, Drew and I were still sitting there working and uh, I got my, my ritual phone call after the game from Alec Bussey, RIP. Not dead, uh, you know, just covering Iowa State, kind of the same thing. Um, and he he's talking to me, and you know, we're, we're we're just shooting the crap on everything. And I bring up like the one thing that hurts K State this year that you think about it, like because I was thinking of some of those other Bruce Bubble teams. So like my freshman year, 16, 17, the first four team, they lost at home to TCU. That was like they had that stretch there where they lost just. Yeah disappointing games at TCU and Oklahoma State at home in heartbreaking fashion. What they got the opportunity to do, though, was go on the road and beat those teams there. And mm-hmm. they, they did beat TCU. I remember that being a big one. I can't they, – did they beat Oklahoma State on the road that season? I, I can't remember. But anyways, they had that opportunity. What hurts K-State, and we talked about this going into the season, but I don't think we realized for, you know, how the, the way things would ultimately work out – Um how things end up playing out for them with the schedule because it's like it would have been nice to have Houston at home or Texas at home because you feel better having chances against those teams at home as opposed to going on the road. It seems like it may hurt you. The way K-State's schedule worked out in the Big 12, if you compare it to Cincinnati's, K-State got TCU at home, so it's a quad two game. They got Oklahoma at home, so it's a quad two game. Uh, They got UCF at home, so it's a quad two game. Cincinnati got the benefit of going to play at UCF. That's a quad one game for Cincinnati, which seems like a load of crap. They got to play at Oklahoma, quad one game. They got to play at TCU, quad one game. They got to kind of grift against the like the low end teams that are going to that could possibly count as quad one. Whereas K State's easiest quad one game that they've been gifted is when they go to Cincinnati. So they have to take care of business in that game. Mm-hmm. But this is one of those ways where the schedule math of the unbalanced schedule, it doesn't just impact the teams that are going to win the league, like you know Bill Self talked about after their game in Ames. It also is going to impact the bubble teams. And K-State is one of those teams that's going to be impacted by it because if they had quad one opportunities at TCU and at Oklahoma, then you would feel like they've got a chance and we're, we're possibly talking about this team with more road wins or more significant quad one wins. Like they missed their chance at Texas Tech by one point. That was a a, a crap show. We know that and everything. But that's the one thing that I look back on on this, that outside of K-State's control, you know, you can go out and win these games. I get that. But 
this is where there was a little bit of unfairness in how the schedule shakes out. In some years, it's going to help K-State. In other years, it's going to hurt them. And in year one, it seems like it's going to hurt them. Yeah, and even – even that Texas Tech game, if that's at, if that would have been at home, that would have been a quad one game instead of having to go on the road and have that be a quad one game. So it it, it sucks how that kind of turned out, but it, it really seems like Saturday is an elimination game of sorts where winner stays alive and loser is probably looking toward the, towards the NIT. Yeah, but by the way. K State went and won at TCU by one after losing at Oklahoma by 30 in 2017. Yeah, I rem- uh, look, I was at that Oklahoma game. <laughs> Boy, shout out to the guy with one arm that told me how good Trey Young was going to be. And I was just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. There's some kid in Norman that's going to be good. Yeah, I don't buy that. You've uh, seen some yeah. clunkers in Norman. Yeah, yeah. No, I've only been to two games at the Lloyd Noble Center and. <laughs> It was K State getting beat by 30 in 2017, and then whatever you would call last year's game on Valentine's Day. So I'm I'm glad I don't ever have to go back there again. Um, in terms of of what K State can realistically do against this schedule, I mean, what is what is the target here, and how likely is it that they go two and two? Because I I will say this, like I'm with you, Drew, nine and nine. I don't know, like based on the resume, that it's a lock. But at the end of the day, I would also hold out hope that the committee is going to overvalue K-State being in the Big 12 and look at it and Mm -hmm. say, okay, we get it. Overall, the metrics aren't great, but they are 8-10 and in the Big 12. And you're also going to be able to look at it and say they do have wins against teams that the committee favors right now in KU and Baylor and you know BYU will will have an okay look at the end of the year. And so it would also be big if they could get that home win against Iowa State. Because I think if you go two and two over the next four games, but one of the wins is against Iowa State or an Allen, but I I don't think that's going to happen. I think that they're going to have a very compelling case, no matter what the net says and what the overall quad one and quad two numbers say and the road win situation. Yeah, I think if if you're going to get two wins, you got to beat West Virginia at home. And then winning over Iowa State helps you more than winning over Cincinnati of the two. Like you beat Iowa State because there is this thing that, you know, they don't talk about a lot, but but you hear these the committee people talk or people that done have done the mocks. There's kind of quad 1A and quad 1B. And KU, Iowa State, and Baylor right now, even though they had no in two week, are all quad 1A teams. And, and BYU is a borderline quad 1A win. So the more quad 1A wins you have, the better – it looks in the committee's eyes because there you see once in a while, although if you look at the NCAA's website, they don't have it, but sometimes a team sheet will have a, a quad 1A and a quad 1B broke down on the sheet. So that is something that could be in K-State's favor. KU's in, in looking in good shape, like they're going to be for sure a quad 1A team, and Iowa State for sure will be a quad 1A team, and Baylor's kind of borderline right now. So uh, that would be a factor to get to that 8 and 10 spot, I think. Winning at Cincinnati would be great. Cincinnati's the only team that had an 0-2 week this week in the Big 12. Um, and it, I do think is floundering. I think they're, the the run of playing in the Big 12 is catching up with them. But having K-State at home is going to be kind of their respite. Like, they go to Houston this week in their week game. So they're probably going to get destroyed in that one because Houston at home is ridiculous. But Cincinnati playing us next Saturday is going to be their – season probably basically on the line and and maybe even their season to make the NIT like they're in that situation uh whereas I think we're maybe in better shape to make the NIT even though the net rankings are different right now so that'll be interesting to see what happens but you know I, I do think you got to win both home games if, if you want any shot right now yeah I, I'd be really worried at eight and ten I'm I'd, already yeah I would too yeah. I'm already kind of freaking out about nine and nine. Yeah. So eight and ten, and you're really not comfortable. Nine and nine, and going one and one in Kansas City, I think gets the job done. Yeah. But it it really comes down to it really does feel like an elimination game on Saturday because well, he's not going to win an Allen. K State's won an Allen one time since Mason and I have been alive. Shout out Cartier Martin, yeah. uh, my guy. Uh, I will say this, and, and Drew, I'll give Drew credit for this because he pointed it out after, and because I brought this up just 
K-State with their win today, Cincinnati's lost. They have moved out of what I'm calling loser day at the Big 12 tournament. They don't have to play on Tuesday as of right now with the bottom four teams. And Drew made a good point. One and one in Kansas City with your win on Wednesday and your loss on Thursday is going to look a lot better than if you show up and even if you get three or four wins down the stretch here, um, or you get two or three wins down the stretch here and you get to eight or nine, it's going to look better than one and one going. You know, Tuesday, hey, awesome, yeah. you, you beat you beat UCF for you beat West Virginia. West Virginia, and then you turned around yeah. and you lost to. Uh, whoever it would be, which I guess it would probably be whoever starts like Baylor or uh, KU or something. That's not as good. If you can go into it, secure your spot in in on Wednesday, not having to play Tuesday, and you get to play somebody like Oklahoma or whoever it ends up being, maybe BYU again, and then you go to the next day and you play, that's going to give you a, a better chance of of not having, you know, to be written off. You can get yourself a win that makes sense and matters. Possibly. I, I think that the whole conference tournament win thing has been devalued a lot over the last few years. We've seen that. But I do think in the case of K-State where the the margin could be paper thin, I think that they will get some benefit of the doubt. Whereas I think that 2017 team, they feel like one of the last teams that got the benefit of, hey, they got a good win in the conference tournament. And then they turned around and almost beat that West Virginia team in the semifinal. I think if K-State showed up and did something similar to that, it would actually help them as opposed to, you know, you look around, congrats to Texas A&M for getting the SEC tournament title game two years ago or whatever. There were like two and a half good teams in the SEC. The Big 12 is still the best basketball league, and it's still valued at a crazy level. And I think that's going to help them in the end if they can take care of a couple more games of business. Uh, are we worried at all that Miami is going to drop to a quad three loss? Because speaking of teams in a free fall, God, they they yeah. are really falling. Yeah, uh, that that might happen when we wake up. So again, we're recording this Saturday night. They were ninety going into the day. They lost to Georgia Tech at home, right? Yeah, and Georgia yeah, Tech one hundred forty five in the net. Yeah, uh, that's probably going to end up being a quad three game. Uh, but hey, that means the Cats are going to be five hundred in quad two. So <laughs> what do you you know what do you what do you do with that? Is it actually a good thing? People are asking. Uh, that's what I think. And I, I do think the committee does look – I don't know how much context they put in those games. Like, clearly at the beginning of the season, you see U.S. Uh, – Southern Cal and, and Miami were looked at. When we played the game, that wasn't a bad loss. But now they are bad losses for sure. So yeah. I, I do think they – while they don't look at last 10 anymore and they don't look at – you know, when the game is played as much. I do think that wouldn't be killers. Like losing at Oklahoma State is still, I think, much more of a killer than losing either one of those two games, for example. Well, losing when, the TCU in the last minute is probably more of a killer than losing those two games. What, what really kills now about that Oklahoma State game is that would, that would be a quad two win right now. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's true. <laughs> uh, and Oklahoma State had a chance to beat Oklahoma today. And, uh, it's got to beat them, to- yeah. So, uh, all right, time for our favorite game then. We've, we've gone through kind of the resume stuff and, and what we think. NCAA, NIT, or nothing for the Cats after they get a win and are back on track. Where's everybody feeling? Who's bold enough to say NCAA? Uh, who still sucks and is going to say nothing? Or who's just going <laughs> to play it safe and say the NIT? Uh, Drew, you get to go last this time. I will Ooh. go first. And I will say that K State. Uh, I kind of feel boomer busty on this. I kind of feel like at this stage of, of where things are, they either they use this as a rally and they do get slide into the NCAA tournament, and we're getting to experience Dayton, Ohio, or <laughs> they just miss out because UCF and Cincinnati end up in better net spots in the NIT. Looks around and they have to, you know, they have to catered to all the crybaby mid-major schools that are like, you took away our spots in this tournament. <laughs> like, okay, whatever, losers. I don't need to watch South Florida playing this. Selton Miguel can go sit on the bench. Uh, I think K-State probably plays in the NIT. I just, uh, I think yeah. with this win, 16 now, at the worst they can finish is 16 and 16. Um, I, this, this is a tournament that, at the end of the day, they've made this move to wanting to guarantee 
spots to more power six leagues, I think that they're going to want, if they see, okay, another Big 12 school here, they will toss K-State a bone. I wouldn't even feel great about the 16 and 16, um, but I don't think that's likely. I think they get at least another win. And I, I think K-State does probably end up in the NIT. I, it, it is a, it's just a tall task for the NCAA tournament, and the cards are stacked against them. Um, but I'm going to treat K-State like a bubble team, and I'm going to you know put the, the pressure on them and, and call things like they're still fighting for an NCAA tournament spot, as unlikely as it seems like it may be, because they have to be pretty good, and they have to prove to be a different team than what they really have over the last month. So I'm going to say NIT for now. Yeah, I would I would agree with you. I think in IT, I think the only reason I would say nothing is if they would lose to West Virginia at home on Monday, which I don't expect to happen. But I think if you beat West Virginia, even if you lose the last three, you probably get a Tuesday game. You probably win that and get to 18 wins. And even if you're not in the top two of the rest of the Big 12, you're probably in IT at large at worst. So I think NIT's Given a win on Monday night against West Virginia, which I think will happen, I think NIT is pretty much a given. Also, uh, look at here are some teams that made the NIT last year. Washington State made it at 17 and 16 out of the Pac 12, which was not very good last year. Oklahoma State made it at 18 and 15 out of the Big 12 last season. Um, and I know that you know Mike Boynton probably cried and said, Well, actually, it's it's tougher to make the NIT since I did it. <laughs> Uh, whatever he wants to say, they were eight and ten in the Big Twelve last season when they did that. Something that's in play for K State. And if you look at what their their conference wins were last year, it was West Virginia, Oklahoma, Iowa State, good one, Oklahoma, Texas Tech, Iowa State, Texas Tech, and Oklahoma. Those were their wins last year uh, in the Big Twelve. So they didn't have great quality wins last season and got in. So K State in that similar boat. Other teams that got in, Florida at 16 and 16 out of the SEC, Wisconsin 17 and 14 out of the Big Ten, Villanova at 17 and 16, Michigan 17 and 15. Um, let's see who else would be comparable. Colorado at 17 and 16, Seton Hall at 17 and 15. So there are a lot of comparable teams. And the more I look at that, the more I start to think to myself, well, actually, I, I don't know that K State misses this thing now as long as they don't <laughs> lose out. Um, and that was with guarantees for mid majors that won their conference and didn't win. Their yeah, conference. exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Uh, and that, that's the other thing too is that you're going to look at this year and see how many teams that actually won uh, their their league are, are going to take care of business in their conference tournament still. Because I do think those teams would still get the benefit. Like if South Florida doesn't collapse and they win the AAC regular season title they'll be an NIT team, even if they don't win the conference tournament. But uh, time to put Drew to the screws here, NCAA, NIT, or nothing. For now, I'll say NIT. I mean, we, I talked with you guys before we recorded. I said this team feels like it's either going to be Team 69 or Team 68. So we play this game next week, and you beat Cincinnati and beat West Virginia, I might say NCAA tournament. But right now, it just feels like if they – can get to where we say that they might get left out and we're going to be thinking about the loss of Texas Tech, the loss of TCU, not being competitive against Oklahoma, losing to Oklahoma State on the road. It, it just feels like when you have that many things that you can be like, oh, they were like one play away or just didn't play well that night, that it just feels like that could come back to haunt you pretty easily. Very true. Uh, I, I go back and I look at the 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 2017 K State team, and like we can do the same thing I just did with Oklahoma State, the team that did sneak in the, the first four. Their conference wins were Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, West Virginia, which was a good one. Uh, that was a that was a fun game. Uh, it was blackout in Bramlage uh, at Baylor, which was massive. But then everything else, it was Texas, TCU, Texas Tech. And then Baylor again in the Big 12 tournament uh, is is what they did. Now their overall record was better. They were 20 and 12 because they uh, they ended up going 11 and two in non conference play. So that was at least the benefit there to them. But that team also, I would say at the end of the day, comparable in terms of what the wins might stack up looking like. And 
I mean, if we're, we're being honest, K-State this year uh, is in position to ha have some better wins than what that team even did, or at least comparable wins to what their good ones were. So we'll see. Uh, at the end of the day, if K-State loses out, though, we're going to have a lot of things to look back on and say that was frustrating and that could have gone differently or should have gone differently, and they'll have nobody to blame but themselves. Uh, I'll end it here. We'll, we'll, we'll shift real quick, use the final you know five to ten minutes to talk a little bit about football because we've been hitting it pretty hard this past week. Uh, we've also been, Drew and I, big on the, the EA Sports stuff going on with the uh, game. So the first question is for fan, uh, will this make you buy a PlayStation 5 and fire up and, and want to play uh, a new college football video game? It, it does make me think about it, to be honest, because I, I do like my foray into uh, college football games was – probably about the time you guys were born um, playing uh, I think college football 96 or seven was Bill Walsh Bill Walsh college football was I think the first edition EA Sports had in 96 or seven and I, I bought it for my Sega Genesis so that that tells you a little bit about my age but uh, and Nebraska 95 was super good on that like there was Nebraska 96 was potent tommy frazier was ridiculous on that game so i do think about those days like me and the guys played like because there was no online playing back then so i, I don't <laughs> you probably don't know about that but you only you had to play, no, you had to I, play I've, got, I've got brothers i we there you had been to be you had to be in there. person and play with them like that was so we would go like into the basement of of uh one of the residence halls and, and set up my sega and play games against each other so that is nostalgic. Like it would be fun to play again. Like I haven't played since probably 10 or 12 uh, when, when the last few editions of the game came out. So it, it would make me think about it for sure. We'll get fan in on a KSO online dynasty. That's, that's <laughs> what that sounds like. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, so Drew and I, we, we combined and teamed up to, to put together what we thought the ratings for players would be. Uh, in your eyes, who do you think the three highest rated players in the game would be for K-State going into this season? I think Avery Johnson would be up there. I think uh, DJ Giddens would be up there. And then def defensively, probably, man, that's that's tougher on defense, but probably Parrish, maybe. I don't know. I would, I would guess those three. What do you guys say? Well, Drew and I both, I think, had DJ as the highest rated guy, we thought. Yeah. Um, and then Avery will be up there. Uh, defensively, it is tough because I think you have some solid options there. I just don't know that you're going to have anybody that kind of blows you away. Um, mm -hmm. And I just think so many of the guys, like, they're, they're still kind of trying to find their footing for different reasons. Um, where some guys, they're inexperienced at this level or inexperienced in total – with how much they've played. But I do think there are some quality guys. Um, I think I think Parrish is probably a good bet because, again, this isn't necessarily about, like, oh, this guy should be the highest. It's more like how do these games work and, and everything. Yeah. He's the top corner on the team. He has played well. He, you know, you can project that he's going to get better, too. So that's probably not a, not a bad route to go. It, I will say it's very hard to come up with these ratings, not knowing what EA is going to do and how the new progression will work, because that that's my biggest complaint about mm -hmm. 14. I don't need everybody getting a lot better on this game. I need like some guys go like plus 10 in the off season. Or, like some guys go like minus two and I'd be, if I'd be fine. Yeah. Some guys, some guys can be Carlos Strickland, you know, <laughs> they doesn't have to get yeah. better. Yeah. Um, like, like what do you do with Jace Brown? Cause I think, he's a good player and he did some good yeah. things on the stretch. So like he should be, but he only, he only really did anything for six games because he yeah. was a true freshman. And uh, that that's the one that I like, I think people were maybe he was one of the ones that with the grade I gave, like people were the most upset or like he should be higher. And I was like, I don't necessarily disagree because he's got speed and he had the production, but it was minimal and he's only yeah. going to be a sophomore. That's really contributed for, six games in reality. So it, it'll be interesting to kind of watch and see in terms of kind of thinking about this game. This is a non game related question though, but it stems from this, from thinking about the ratings and everything else from guys that were on last year's team 
that are going into this year's, who has to make the biggest jump in the way that they play for K-State to be a better team? It can be offense or defense, or if you have a couple of guys in mind, you can go with that. But it got me kind of thinking because Jace Brown could be one of those guys where you say, okay, it was nice what you did as a true freshman, but now you got to go up another level because you might be the the best guy on this team at that spot. Now, I think the hope for K-State would be that that's not the case and that it is Dante Cephas because that's who you brought in. But if Jace Brown's better than him, then you're, you probably have two pretty good receivers, I would think. Um, or defensively, you look around and you say, hey, Marquis Siegel, maybe catch some of those passes that hit your hands and turn them into interceptions. That might be something that improves things rapidly. I don't know. Uh, so I'll, I'll let Drew kick it off here. Uh, who would be the guys that need to take big jumps for K-State in 2024? Uh, I think right off the bat, the first one that I thought of actually was a wide receiver, that's Keegan Johnson. You'd hope that his second year in the program that he could really take a jump because like you talked about with Jace Brown and Dante Cephas, well, if Keegan Johnson is also on that level, K-State's going to be a pretty freaking good offense, you would imagine. And then uh, defensively, it, it defensively is tougher because I think that some guys like you'll just see naturally take a jump, but I'll, I'll say Uso probably because of how much hype that he had at big 12 media day. He was, he was fine this past season, but he was nothing that he was really hyped up to be and dealt with a lot of injuries. So I, I'd like to see him take a jump because with his athleticism at his size in a three, three, five, like he is one of the most valuable players on the entire team. Yeah, I, I would say um, whoever can step up at defensive end. Like, I think you need all three levels. I, I, I agree with you on Uso, but I think you need a playmaker at defensive end. And of the guys returning, you know, I think the potential there probably maybe you would say Toby. You know, if Toby can be that legit playmaker at defensive end, because I, I like stuff with being in Mott coming back. I think they're solid, but, you know, you need a guy that's got that motor and high level athleticism. And I think that could be Toby as being the guy that can be the Felix type uh, player at that spot. So that's kind of where I lean is, you know, I think we've got some diff decent linebacker prospects coming back. We've got some decent secondary good prospects coming back, but if you don't have a player at all three levels that can really make a play, you're limited on defense. And so I, I would say whoever can step up at defensive end. That that's that's a good one there because as you were talking about and you brought him up, I like I'm not I'm not trying to say that he will be Felix, but it needs to be like I, I can vividly remember 2021 Big 12 Media Days, and I'm sitting there at the table in between breaks, or probably because I had nothing to do on day two because KU no showed uh, because I guess they didn't they couldn't read a weather forecast or whatever. <laughs> wildest thing and then the KU sports information department is trash at getting you set up like I was doing the Lord's work as a K-State grad trying to give even airtime in Wichita for KU and they just never wanted to get back to me so uh they're K they're, they are trash they are terrible they're at the worst SIDs I've ever dealt with don't feel bad about saying that but I remember why it came down and, and sat next to me and we're talking and he's like man who do you think needs to like step up and I said you know, he was Felix and DK at the time. And that's who I said. And I remember us talking about him and, and going back and forth for, for probably five or 10 minutes. And then, yeah, he, he came alive, caught fire that year. And then obviously 2022, he, he was what he was. I do think that like Toby is probably that guy that you would project there because he has the size to go with it. And you have solid contributors, like you said, Mott, Stuffelbean, some of the other guys that are going to be in there to kind of fill the holes. But that's the one where if he can make a big jump, you feel like you do have a playmaker waiting because that's one of the things that was missing from the defense last year, I mm -hmm. think, was like there were some guys that were fine on the edge, but Khalid Duke, and maybe it's the injuries, it was kind of a disappointment the last two seasons where I know he got hurt in 2021 mm -hmm. and all that, and, and, and so he dealt with things throughout. But I expected more from him last season, and you just didn't really have anything like that. And also, like last year – Brendan Mott, to an extent, I expected a little bit more out of because I thought he had a really good 2022. So I think it's important that you do get a guy there, and, and that's probably what does benefit them a lot. But, I mean, Drew's right. I mean, think of how many times last year we talked about, you know, K-State just getting crushed by the run at times. 
Um, a, a helpful way to stop that is if you can at least plug things up the middle and Uso can play a part of that. And, you know, at times he's proven that he can be disruptive even in the middle of the line there. And, and Javon Banks also did that at times this season when he was inside. So we'll see how it looks. But a uh, couple football questions to throw your guys' way, and uh, we'll get out of here after a, a tight hour where K-State basketball wins. And uh, if you're listening to this in the morning on Sunday, hopeful for a, a K-State women's basketball win as they are on the road in Lawrence today to try and keep pace. Oklahoma just keeps to get winning games. Like I don't, I don't get the, the Oklahoma women's situation, how they're doing it. Uh, but K-State still very alive in the women's basketball hunt for the Big 12 title. K-State baseball, I already do not care about their season. Uh, you lose the Holy <laughs> Cross, you are, you just keep committing the same sins that you've committed before. And uh, if you, you're asking yourself at the end of the year, why is K-State baseball on the outside looking into the NCAA tournament? Well, you don't lose home games to Holy Cross. I don't care about this or that. Holy Cross is pathetic. You should win that game at home. You didn't. You give up that many runs to a, a scrub team. K-State baseball dead in my eyes for right now. Uh, but it'll be fun when they win like three of their first four games in Arlington and we're like, oh, look at this, Team 68. Are they, are they going to get in? Don't care. Don't worry about him. Uh, I'll root pretty hard for Kalen Culpepper when he's in the big leagues, but uh, he just doesn't have enough help around him, uh, either in the dugout or on the field. So that will do it for Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan. I'm Mason Vo. Thank you for watching and listening to the KSO Show. For more K-State information, head over to kstateonline.com. Add on three. D.Y., Drew, they do great stuff there. I kind of lurk in the wings and uh, wait for them to give me something to do uh, so I can step up and, and not be such a freeloader. So – we are out of here. We'll talk to you again next Sunday with this crew. We'll see how the week looks for K-State basketball, and then we'll have content daily throughout the week on the K-State YouTube page. So that'll be it for us. We're out of here.